Good afternoon. Welcome to the spring semester at MIT. <laughs> As you know, my name is Dave Schmidtlein, and I'm delighted um, to welcome you to uh, the Dean's Innovative Leader Series and to introduce our speaker uh, for today, Paul Anderson. Paul has had a series of extraordinary leadership responsibilities in sectors that are important to the global economy and that resonate very well here on campus. Many of you already know that he's served um, as chairman of Spectra Energy. He served as CEO and chairman of Duke Energy. He served as CEO of BHP Billiton. Um, in fact, um, at initially BHP, he formed the largest diversified resources company on planet Earth. Uh, he currently serves on the board for BP, and not only you know, in the realms of energy and mining and so on are a number of his interests aligned with MIT's interest, but he's also been very generous in participating with our community, sharing his insights with our EMBA students, executive MBA students, uh, he's also participated in our Managing an Adversity course, and it was so wonderful to see Paul being willing to spend time with you all here this afternoon. Please welcome Paul Anderson. Well, thank you, Dave, and thank you all for coming today. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, actually see who's going to run the world in the future. Uh, about, uh, well, I don't, more years ago than I'd like to admit, I was in an auditorium like this at Stanford University uh, uh, receiving an MBA, and a fellow came in and offered some thoughts as to lessons that he'd learned along the way. His name was Harold Janine, and I'm sure he's long dead, and most of you have never heard that name, but he was a huge industrialist at the time. And he had a lot of thoughts. And the thoughts he, he uh, laid out that day stuck with me so much, I actually wrote them down. And I found this sheet of paper from when I was sitting in the audience. And I was just looking at them before I, I came here. And they have really stuck with me. The, the first one isn't on this piece of paper because it was so powerful, I just remembered it. He said, don't run out of cash. Now, you know, that sounds pretty obvious. <laughs> but I can't tell you how many times I have run into entrepreneurs and, you know, businessmen that are pretty far along and people with growing companies and what have you that run out of cash. And when you run out of cash, they take you out of the game. It doesn't matter how good you are, how good your company is. Uh, for some reason, people expect you to have cash. And, uh, and that was a very powerful message. It stuck with me. Uh, there, there are a number of other things on this list. Uh, one, and, and might be useful to somebody just graduating. Uh, you know, you're going to learn a lot here. Uh, don't use knowledge as a club. Something to think about when you get out. It's very easy to do. Uh, another, don't attack people, attack their ideas. Uh, and, and one that particularly stuck with me was don't get so excited about your solution that you fail to present it properly. That having the right answer is useless unless you convince others that it is the right answer. So now the interesting thing is there, there's a whole list of these and I won't go through all of them. But the, the, the really interesting thing is this was decades ago. And every one of those messages is true today. Now, you, you think back, you know, at the time I went to school, there was a war going on in Vietnam. The Soviet Union was there. There was a Berlin Wall. Uh, nobody had even heard of a cell phone, uh, let alone the internet. Uh, you know, it, it was a whole different world. Uh, the social media didn't exist. But yet these lessons are just as valid today as they were 
back then. And that's because 90% of the things that you're going to deal with will not be technology. They will not be how do you make a uh, pancake today versus uh, the way you did 50 years ago. It will be people. And the biggest management challenge you have will be to manage yourself. And so what I'd like to do is just spend the next few minutes here talking about some of the lessons I learned during my career uh, in the management of people, including myself, with the idea that, you know, maybe you'll look back a decade from now and say, my god, that old fart was right. <laughs> you know? The, uh, that, uh, that still does make sense. I'm running for office, so I need to have that. Uh, so so I, I guess what I'd like to do is start with managing yourself and then move, moving on to managing your business or, or whatever you're involved in. And I think the, the first thing that I found when I graduated is that you actually have to take responsibility for your career. Now, you've had a lot of nurturing up till now. You've had advisors. You've had parents. You've had friends that are interested in, you know, where are you going, what are you, uh, what are you doing in terms of a career. And when you graduate, a lot of that nurturing just disappears. And when I left business school, uh, it was a bit of a shock to me. I, I went to Ford Motor Company. It was my first job. And I, I started the first week. I was a, a newly minted MBA, and I was ready to change Ford, change the world make uh, wonderful contributions to, to society. And I w walked into my supervisor the first day, and I said, well, I'm ready. What do you want me to do? And he handed me a, a stack of papers. And he said, these papers are for the next policy meeting. Uh, and here's a list of the people that attend that meeting. I want you to deliver them. And I said, what do you mean, deliver them? He said, well, Deliver them. Uh, <laughs> you know, didn't you go to school? Didn't they teach you that in MBA school? Uh, and uh, so I took the list, and he, he gave me a little map because they went to the head of the engine plant and the head of the plastics plant and the head of the metal stamping plant. So I had to drive around the Detroit area and deliver these. He said they're very important. They're, they're, uh, we want to make sure that these people actually get these papers. I thought, well, you know. Sure, I sure am overqualified for this job, but what the hell. So the next day, I came back in having delivered all these papers, and I said, uh, OK, I'm ready. It's my second day. What do you want me to do? Gave me another stack of papers. <laughs> he said, deliver these. <laughs> well, this time I didn't ask, you know, do you really mean deliver? I've, I've, I've kind of gotten the message, all right, I'm, I'm going to end up delivering these things. The entire week, every day, I delivered papers. So Friday night, I came storming into his office, and I said, you know, you don't understand. I am an MBA. I have an engineering degree. I am really smart. And I'm wasting my time delivering papers. And he, he, said, he looked at me, and he said, did you read the papers? And I said, well, no. I said, uh, you told me to deliver them. I said, well, you could have read them, right? I said, yeah, but I just delivered them. I said, did you meet the people that you delivered them to? I said, well, no. Uh, I guess I probably should have introduced myself. I said, did you tour any of the facilities, get an idea of what they were doing, what have you? I said, no. no. He said, well, let, let me get this right. He said, you've had a chance to read about all the important issues of this company. You've had a chance to meet everybody in the company who matters and tour all the facilities. And you think you're delivering papers. <laughs> well, you know, if ever it struck me that I'm going to have to figure out how to make my job work for me, that was it. I mean, he was, he was basically saying, you know, Man, I can, I can take a horse to water, but I can't make you drink. You need to understand what you're doing here. And that was a, a great lesson, is to learn that, you know, even what you might think is the worst job, there's something in it that you can get out of it if you want to try. And you just have to keep 
thinking of it in that aspect instead of saying, okay, I came here to change the world and I don't see that this has anything to do with changing the world. Uh, and you know, you might know that already, but I'll bet that there's some point when you get out of here that you're gonna feel like you're, uh, you're overqualified for whatever it is you're doing. Uh, the second thing is, is don't waste your time on excuses. Uh, I can't tell you how much emotional energy people put in to excuses. And I have a plaque on, on my office wall that the folks at Duke gave to me because I think they were getting sick of hearing it. And it says, only you and your mother care about the reasons. <laughs> and, and it was basically, you know, don't tell me why you didn't do it, why you couldn't do it, why it didn't work the way you wanted it to. You know, if, if, it, if you didn't do it, you didn't do it. I really don't give a damn uh, what the reasons are. Now, it's not that I'm not compassionate, but uh, you know, it just doesn't add anything to, uh, to understand unless there's a lesson to be learned in, in that. And you know, as I said, so many people put a lot of emotional energy into uh, what the excuses are, what the reasons are. You need to understand the difference between real limitations uh, probably choices, things that you've made choices on, and then just plain excuses. And the excuses waste the most time. You, know, you can agonize over why you didn't get that job, and you can say, well, it's because the interviewer was biased. Uh, he, he had a gender bias, or he had a racial bias, or he didn't like body piercings, or you know, th there, was, there was a real bias on the part of that uh, that person that made the decision. But you know, maybe, just maybe, it was because you made a choice to take an easier workload. Or you know, if you're in a, a job, you had decided to take off during the busiest season of the year for that company and leave everybody hanging. Uh, and, uh, and they remember that. Uh, you know, you, the, there's probably a lot of things that uh, you can point to before you can point to the excuses of things that, that you can't change. I, I have a, a nephew who uh, graduated from culinary school. And the one thing they told him was, uh, you know, whatever you do, if you're going to work in, in nice restaurants, nice uh, uh, eating environments, don't get any tattoos where they show. And the first thing he did, of course, as soon as he heard that, he, he got a big tattoo that had his girlfriend's name on, who's subsequently gone the way of the dodo bird. Uh, but he, he, he's going to live with this for the rest of his life. And now he's in a kitchen at 100 degrees with long sleeve chef's jackets because nobody will, will hire him if they have to look at his tattoo. Uh, you, know, the, the, you can make choices. There's nothing wrong with that. But, but ultimately, your life is just the sum of, of these choices. Now, I don't mean to say that you should let your limitations limit you. You, you just need to figure out what you can do something about and what you can't. I can't tell you how many people have sent me resumes uh, with errors in them. Obviously, they ran it through a spell check and stopped, or a cover letter that didn't make sense. Uh, they spelled my name wrong. There's nothing you can do worse than, than getting the name of the person that you're trying to get a job from wrong. Uh, that, that's the first thing that sticks with them. Uh, you know, th things like learning to spell, speaking in complete sentences, learning a little adequate, dressing appropriately for an interview. There's a lot of things that you can do. And, and if you do those things, they will probably overwhelm in your total career the things you can't do anything about. You know, I, unless you have a goal like if I want it to be a ballerina, I, I'm probably a little out of luck. But, uh, but there, there is a lot you can do to build on, on what you have. I, I mean, I look at, at my personal case. Uh, a lot of people say, well, gee, you went to Stanford. You're, you know, the privileged white guy and all this kind of stuff. You know, you, were, you, you just happened to be born into it. Uh, well, I, you know, I came from a blue-collar family. Uh, I hung out with a rock band instead of going to high school, got married at 19. When I was sitting in this audience, I had a child. 
Uh, and so, you know, you, it doesn't mean that you have to just say, gee, you know, here's, I'm limited because of this, that, and the other thing. You take what you've got and then you figure out, well, how do I make something to overcome uh, these limitations? Uh, another thing that might uh, seem obvious, but I think it's worth saying, is stay outside your comfort zone. Now, when you're looking at taking on a new job, there will be some jobs that you'll say, gee, that sounds really interesting, but I don't think I can do it. And, and you really ought to be very cautious about safety. You don't want to be in your comfort zone the whole time. Uh, Dave mentioned that I uh, took on uh, BHP. It's an Australian company. When I took it on, BHP was a 100-year-old company. It was uh, all Australian. It had a totally Australian board. It had all kinds of problems. It was obviously located in Australia. Uh, to take on the job, I had to change countries. I had to change companies. And I had to change industries. Now, and, and it was a company in trouble. I mean, it was 90% leveraged, and it was losing money. It lost a billion dollars. And, and back then, that was a lot of money. And uh, you know, it just had all sorts of issues. And it would have been so easy to say, oh my god, you know, what a disaster this will be. You know, I'll get there, and the, the management won't accept me, and I won't fit into the political system. And you, know, you, could, you could put together a list of 100 reasons you shouldn't take this job. But instead of figuring out you know, what are the reasons that are the things that can go wrong, just start with the list of what if things go right. And I, I've got to say, you know, the best decision I ever made was just to get on a plane and, and immigrate to Australia and say, you know, I'm going I'm to try this on because life's too short not to take an adventure like this. Uh, so, you know, stay outside your comfort zone. Don't, don't just think, you know, gee, I, you know, I'm here in Boston and if I can get a job close by and uh, you know, be close to my parents or what have you, uh, it'll, be, it'll be a safer thing. Uh, think about, you know, what would it be like to, to go to Azerbaijan, you know? Not a bad place, uh, a real, real adventure. Uh, and then the, the last area in terms of, of managing yourself, if you'll indulge me on this, is, is relationships. And, and that's an area that I don't think too many people give that much thought to or, or um, attribute how important relationships are in their career path. Uh, I think that, that you, you have significant others, and you, you may be married, you may not, but you know, usually you have somebody in your life that it can either enhance you or can drag you down. And there are so many folks that I've run into that are dealing with a spouse that they, they complain about constantly and they say, well, they, you know, uh, I, I can't travel because my wife will be upset or, or my husband will be upset or my husband doesn't want to relocate and, and, and blah, 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 blah. And, and they just keep dragging around this stone instead of saying, you know, either I need to view this stone more like the fairy princess, or I need to get rid of this stone. And not that I would encourage divorce, <laughs> but, but all I can say is, is marry well or marry often. Because <laughs> now, now you're going to remember that. <laughs> and, and you know, when, you, when you're sitting there it, in that miserable state where you, you're saying, I don't know if I can take this another day, remember that and just get over it. You know, the, the, uh, there's no reason to, to drag out these things. Now, I, I've, I've, uh, I've married uh, well and often, and, <laughs> and my, my current wife is night and day to my career what, what my original wife was. I mean, my, my current wife is, first of all, I'm very lucky. She's, uh, uh, she's a uh, uh, MBA, uh, chartered financial analyst. Uh, she was a, 
an officer at Enron. Uh, she didn't, she didn't uh, do, the, do the bad things. She did the good things and then left. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, anyway, she, she has a, a very capable background of understanding what I'm doing. And I've found that you, know, you, can, you can take a re relationship and leverage it tremendously. I mean, she has been a tremendous help in my career. I would never have gotten to where I am now if, uh, if she hadn't been involved because she was there uh, taking the plant tours with me. Uh, you'd go on a plant tour, the plant managers, you know, j jacking you around, showing you everything that they want you to see. And I'd see her up on a catwalk with the day shift superintendent. And at the end of the day, we'd get together and I'd say, you know, boy, you know, Sam's going to be the, uh, a great guy. He's going he's to be perfect for, uh, you know, becoming the, the manager of the whole organization. And she'll say, no, Sam's going to be gone in two months because Sam's got this issue and that issue. And, and this, this is what's actually happening at the plant. I mean, there were all kinds of inputs uh, that I would get. I, we would give her email address out uh, to any group of employees and say, if you don't want to, to bother me with your issue or you're sensitive about it or you don't think that I'd, I'd want to take the time or what have you, uh, talk to Kathy. Tell her what you're, you're thinking. Tell her what the issues are. And, you know... She'll make sure that the information gets to me by the close of the day and that something comes back to you if you want something. Or you can tell her and tell her not to tell me if, you, you know, if it's about me. But, but whatever. I, I guess my point is think through how your relationship affects your career and how you can leverage the relationship and make it a you know, a truly pleasant experience for you and whoever your significant other is, as opposed to it being a struggle between you and that person. So many people say, I always separate home and work. You know, when I come home, work, I leave work at the office. That's just crap, you know? <laughs> Nobody, the only way they can separate home and work is if you know they're a zombie because you know every day at work changes the way that you're going to approach home when you arrive home and if you if you say I don't want to talk about work I, you know work is not appropriate blah 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 you can't separate those two things so uh, anyway I would just uh, just say you know marry well or marry often uh, now uh, I have a few thoughts here before we go to questions uh, on managing your business. Uh, the, the most important skill, I get to ask all the time, you know, what do you look for in people? What is the most important skill in a manager? If you're going to have somebody be CEO of a company, what is absolutely critical? And the most important skill is communication. Absolutely the most important. And of that, you know, there's, communication is a two-way street. The listening side is the most important aspect of communication. And, and I'll just give you a couple of examples. You know, the, one thing for sure is the group that's here in this room knows more than me. Now, I, I, I wouldn't be uh, intimidated to take on any one of you one-on-one, -on -one, but I sure wouldn't take on this group because you know a hell of a lot more than me as a group. And if you think you know all the answers and you don't need input from others, you, know, you are going to limit yourself tremendously. When I went to B, uh, BHP, the first thing that I did is they had a, a group of what they called the senior management group or something. It was 80 people that were running the company, uh, which in and of itself is an issue. But... Uh, I said, well, before I do anything, I think I'd like to sit down with each and every one of these people and hear their thoughts. I said, you know, I'd give me a two-pager. I sent up appointments with all of them, and I said, I I'm going to spend at least an hour with you. Give me two pages, one that says, you know, who you are, what you do, what your issues are. Uh, you know, are you going to need a billion dollars in the next three weeks for your operation? Or, you know, what, what are the things that I should be aware of? Uh, so I'm not surprised. 
And on the second sheet of paper, say, what would you do if you were me? If you'd come in and taken over this company, if you were CEO of this company, what would you do? And I went through with all 80 of these people. Well, the interesting thing is that in the subsequent two years, we didn't do a thing that somebody didn't have on their second page. Not a thing. I didn't have a, an original idea in my head. You know, I just came in and synthesized the input of 80 people that had a tremendous depth of knowledge and put it together into a, a strategy and a, uh, a business plan that made sense and that turned the company around. And you say, well, you know, why did they need you? You know, if they knew what to do, why didn't they just do it? And the, the answer is pretty straightforward. You know, some people said, well, it's not my job. Uh, other people said, well, you know, it's, it, it would require firing one of my best friends. Uh, other people said, you know, the culture won't allow it. The, the government won't allow it. They, 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 had, they had already made up in their own mind reasons why it couldn't be done. They said, you know, it needs to be done, but I can't do it, or it can't be done for the following reasons. But yet everybody knew exactly what had to be done. I mean, the, you know, there were things on there, you know, we're killing people in Zimbabwe because we have, have uh, mine sealing falls. We've got to do something about that. And you say, well, why haven't you closed the, uh, the facility? Well, you know, Mugabe's all would get all over us and what have you. And, and besides, it's not really my area. Uh, I just, I hear this. Uh, and so, you know, you had this whole list of things. And at the end of the day, there was nothing we did that wasn't on that list. I did the same thing when I went to Duke. Two pages, talked to the, the senior guys. Out of the entire group, there wasn't a single person. Well, there was one person. Uh, but with the exception of the CFO, everybody else had on their list, fire the CFO. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I did. And, <laughs> It seemed like an easy thing to do. In fact, I found out later that, that there was a, an office pool as to how long it would take before I fired the CFO. The, the previous CEO didn't want to fire the CFO. He liked him, and they, they got along fine. Uh, but everybody knew that when I came in, that it would be obvious we need to fire the CFO, and, and I, I would do it. And so they had a, a pool that went from, I think it went from, one month to six months, and people had taken spots on it. Well, I fired him in the first two weeks. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure if the person that had one month won that or not. Uh, but, but it was the very same thing. People knew what needed to be done. And so if you just go in and listen, instead of coming in with a whole bunch of ideas, and, and it's hard because you... You have all these great ideas, and you want to come in and say, look, I've got this idea and this idea, and we can do this, we can do that. The very first thing you should, you should say is, what's your idea? And you'll be amazed what you learn just from listening. Now, the other side of that is being able to communicate. Now, in the case of BHP, uh, I took what I'd learned from everybody put it into a, uh, start it with a charter, you know, what is this company? What, why, why are we doing what we're doing? What are the imperatives that we have? What are the values of the company? And how are we gonna judge success? Put it all on a little card and, and would go around and talk to people about that. Now the first attempt at this was put together by the, the PR people, said, oh, we can, we can do this for you, you know, give us your thoughts, and they, they wrote this eloquent thing, and, and we sent it out to, to a kind of a test group, and it came back, and they said, this is a bunch of crap. You know, it looks like it was put together by the PR group, and indeed it was. So I, I took the same, the material I'd given them, and I locked myself in a room, and I hand wrote out this charter, and I gave it to the head of PR, and I said, you know, have somebody type this up and send it out, and let's see if this resonates with people. And he said, no. He said, I'm going to just copy it with your scrawly, crappy handwriting, 
and send it out that way, and we'll send out an interpretation that's typewritten so that people can actually understand what you've got here. But he said, people need to know it's coming from you. And, and it was the best communication I've ever had. It, it established direction for the company. The, the employee base understood this, this is what this guy really believes in. I saw it. He wrote it in his own handwriting. So you know, getting, getting across what you're trying to say is, is extremely important. You, you can't just say it and assume it's been understood. And I, you, you see that in emails all the time. You know, you send an email and you thought you said one thing and, and the receiver received it differently. Uh, it's particularly difficult today. But even in oral communications, I, I, the, the first experience I had where I wasn't understood at all is when I fired somebody. And there was this guy named George in the group. And George was hopeless. And after a while, I, I finally gave up. And I called him in. And I said, George, I don't know how to say this, but things just aren't working out. You know, you just don't fit into this group. And uh, yeah, I, I, I'm sorry, but uh, we just don't have a place for you. And uh, you know, if you go to personnel, I've alerted them. Uh, and they'll, uh, they'll uh, take care of you and you know, tell you what your options are. And you know, you know, are you going to cash out of your 401k and all that? Was, that was what was going through my mind. I just said, they'll, they, they will uh, take care of you. Well, the next morning, George comes into the office. And I said, George, what are you doing here? And he said, well, I thought I'd, I'd uh, straighten up some things before I go down to personnel and find out where my new job is. And I said, oh, <laughs> well, come, come back in my office. We, <laughs> we haven't finished this conversation. So I had to fire him again. And, <laughs> and this time, I was a lot less ambiguous as to what was happening and uh, said, George, you're fired. You don't have a job. I don't want to see you here again. Uh, that was a lot harder to do after you know, I'd already kind of deflated his bubble by telling him he didn't have a place in my organization. Uh, I guess the message here is there's nothing worse than bad news delivered badly. We, we tend to, to try to avoid confrontation. And you know, when, you, when you're delivering a bad message, it's even harder than when you're delivering a good message. It's easy to say you got a raise. I mean, nobody has any problem uh, with that. But to, to say you're fired, that's a little tougher to do. And in performance reviews in, in particular, you have this issue of, of people hearing what they want to hear and you thinking you've said something else. So I guess I would just say, you know, make sure you're understood when you're communicating. Uh, uh, let's see what, uh, the, the, I, I guess the, the, the key about effective communication is if you can align people it's not just that things get a little bit better, it's that they get exponentially better. I mean, the, the difference between, you know, just a crowd at the mall and the Boston Pops orchestras is, is dramatic. It's, it's, it's a group of people. But, you know, if you, if you get everybody aligned as to what you're doing and you get the right people and you get them, uh, thank you, Elizabeth. I'm supposed to speed up here just a, a second. Uh, I, I just have a couple more things. Commit, commitment is very important to, to get from people because it, it'll be dramatic. A couple other aspects of leadership I just throw out. Uh, main event management, very important. It's, it's so easy to get off on the fun stuff instead of what's really important. Uh, and there's a lot of people whose careers are lost because they can never divorce themselves from the fun stuff. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, another thing is uh, don't believe your own press. Uh, it's probably pretty straightforward. And never confuse the person with the office. Uh, at some point, and some of you might be there already. I don't know what all your backgrounds are. As you get into positions of authority and you get into uh, positions where you can uh, place orders, you can hire and fire, so on and so forth. People are going to tell you how brilliant you are. 
uh, and they're and they're going to invite you to things that you never expected to be invited to, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, you, know, you, you don't get invited to Davos because you're a neat person. You get invited to Davos because you're running one of the biggest companies in the world. The day that you step out of that role, it's like somebody just pulled the plug. I mean, I was amazed. I thought I was the funniest, most de desirable guy in the world. Everybody wanted me. I was on their A-list. When I lived in Australia, the prime minister had me over for dinner. And I mean, it was wonderful. And I thought, God, these, these Aussies really know how to appreciate a good person. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, it was amazing that once I stepped down from being CEO of the, country, the country's largest company, uh, it was like somebody just turned the lights out. And you would still get the occasional invitation, but it was really embarrassing because you'd show up. And, and they'd say, oh, and we have here, we have the CEO of BHP Billiton. And you'd say, oh, no, I, I retired uh, last month. And there was this silence and then this, this look to whoever was the administrative person that left you on the list <laughs> that said, it's your ass, man. <laughs> you know. <laughs> How, how did you let me invite this, this guy here when he's a retiree? So, so that's very important. So uh, if I can just summarize takeaways that I hope you come up with uh, or leave with uh, in terms of self, take responsibility for your career. Don't waste time on excuses. Two, stay outside your comfort zone and marry well and often. Three things to remember. Three things in business. Communication's the key, particularly the listening side of it. And, and then one that I didn't get to, but occasionally stop and ask, why am I doing what I'm doing? And is there a better way to do it? That's a whole different topic. And the third one is don't run out of cash. <laughs> now, uh, any uh, questions? Did I go over too long? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I guess we have about 10 minutes for questions here. Yes. When you start, hi, my name is Usman, and I'm from the Sloan Fellows Program. Um, my question is about the, the first list that you read of somebody that you heard a long time ago. And there was this attack, the issue, and not attacking the person. Uh, what is your view about that? Because you didn't elaborate on it uh, in, in your, your list that followed. Oh, well, I, I think it's absolutely critical. Um, I didn't elaborate on it because I didn't think of it. But uh, the, uh, the, of course, I didn't really think of anything. But uh, with that particular one, I couldn't claim. Uh, it's so important if you're going to negotiate with people, if you're going to even manage them or, or do anything with people, that when you disagree with them, you, you don't say, I disagree with you. You say, I disagree with that idea. And, and try to get the idea outside of the person and have the debate all around the idea. As soon as I say, you know, I disagree with you, that immediately puts the other person on the defensive. It becomes a, well, the idea is good because it's my idea as opposed to the idea is good or bad in a vacuum. And, and you become confrontational as opposed to being able to be analytical about the idea. It's, it's hugely important in terms of negotiating if you're in a situation where, and you, you, you negotiate all the time, but sometimes it's, it's clear that you're negotiating. Uh, but as, as soon as you uh, personalize arguments, uh, it just raises the, the bar way up to be able to actually get anything accomplished. There's microphones on both sides. If anybody else have a question? Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. My name is uh, David Feliciano. I'm a second year Sloan student. Um, one of the pieces of advice that you gave us was to get commitment from people and get alignment from a group. And I was wondering if you had any um, really key techniques that you used to achieve that. Well, I, th I think the whole key is uh, what I would call felt leadership, which is to, you've got to be true to what you're trying to get them to do. And uh, I'll give you an example. 
When I was at uh, BHP Billiton for a while, uh, after two years, uh, the company was making money and it was the darling of Wall Street and what have you. But the safety record wasn't very good. And so I called in the head of safety and I said, you know, what's the problem here? Uh, how come you can't get this group to, to understand how important safety is? And he hemmed and hawed for a while and he said, well, frankly, you're the problem. And I said, well, you know, goodbye. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, I asked him to elaborate on that. And, and he said, you're a lousy safety leader. He said, how do you expect to get people to buy into safety if you don't believe in it? And I said, I believe in it. My God, he said, I talk about it all the time. He said, sure, you talk about it, but you don't believe in it. And I said, well, well, what are you talking about? And he said, well, everybody knows every day you jaywalk in front of the building here when you come to work. They, they see you do that. You know, that, that says more about your attitude toward safety than anything you can say. So they know you drive too fast in the garage. Uh, they know that uh, you talk about liking to ride a motorcycle without a helmet. They, uh, and he started down this list, of it, and I said, well, you know, okay, that's around the office. Uh, I, I'll, I'll do better. And he said, but when you're in the field, you're worse. He said, you know, they, they, they notice that you don't use the handrail when you go up and down the stairs. You come in with, with dark uh, shaded safety glasses and into a... a uh, inside place, you take them off because, and you don't replace them with clear glasses. Uh, you, and he started down this this whole list, and I said, "Well, okay, that that's enough." And he said, "No, there's more." He said, <laughs> he said, "When you start asking questions, the first question you ask is, how's your productivity? The second question you ask is, are you on budget? The third question you ask is, how's the safety record?" So they know safety's number three. And I thought, wow. You know, what a message. And so, of course, I completely changed the way that I started addressing the organization and, and focusing on safety. So I think that's, that's an example. I mean, you, you really have to, you, you cannot align an organization around a goal you don't believe in. That's the first thing. You know, you absolutely have to believe in the goal. And then you have to demonstrate that you really believe in it because they're watching for any nuance that says that you deviate from this. You, you, when you get to the point that you're running a, a large organization, you would be amazed at how much everything you do is picked up by that organization. It, it just becomes, uh, you know, it's a, fasc it's a fascination, you know, what's the boss doing? Uh, and, and so you just have to live and eat and breathe whatever the message is. Over so, <clears throat> like you managed to turn around BHP, what was, what did you do differently or in general, what do you do differently from say other leaders which had made you successful? What, what did I do differently at BHP? Yeah, not particularly in BHP, but in general, what do you think like, are the common mistakes made by the leaders which, where you do things differently, which helps you, you know? Well, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I've got my own limitations uh, like everybody else, but if there's one thing that uh, I probably do differently than the average is I move faster. Uh, when you, like firing the CFO in the first two weeks. Uh, the, I think an awful lot of people have trouble dealing with unpleasantness. Uh, and if you can, you know, it's, it's very easy to come into or, an organization and there, there will be things that are just fun to do and to participate in. You know, they, they say, oh, well, we want you to go on CNN and, uh, you know, talk to Jim Cramer. Oh, oh that'll be fun, you know. Uh, you, can, you can do all that. You can, uh, you can address groups. You can uh, meet with retirees. You can do all kinds of stuff that make you feel really good. But, you know, firing people, deciding to close or, uh, down... Uh, facilities and what have you. Those things aren't any fun. And a lot of leaders shy away from that and they, they get into the, well, we'll study it a little bit more, let me think about it, so on and so forth. I, I, when I first came to BHP, in the first month, I, I visited problem facilities and one was a titanium uh, mine out in Western Australia. And at the end of the, the tour, I said, I don't understand how this thing can make money. And the, the 
uh, operations managers said, well, you know, it, it could make money if, if we just get this fixed and this fixed and uh, break on price and so on. He went down this whole list. And I said, well, what's the probability on each one of these things? So, you know, well, there's a 60% probability that we'll get a break on price. Well, there's a 80% probability of this and this, oh, 90% on that. And so at the, at the end, I said, well, if I take all these probabilities together, it looks to me like there's a 1% chance that you'll ever make money. And he looked at it and studied it for a while, and he said, no, I think it's two. <laughs> and I said, we're closing this place down. And he said, well, we'll, we'll do a study. You know, we'll do a study. And, and what's the best way to close it down? And I said, no, we're closing it down. He said, do not order one piece of equipment or any material that isn't uh, associated with closing this down safely. Don't just shut down any, anything else. I think that's probably the biggest difference is an awful lot of leaders let things languish for a while and particularly unpleasant things. So I have a question about uh, marry well or marry often. Oh, uh, yeah. Just kidding. Um, so you're, I'm gonna, you're not my type. <laughs> Mustafa Ali, second year MBA. Um, I had a question about, uh, you talked about uh, graduating from MBA and then kind of you lose these guardrails, the advisors. And I'm curious to hear about how did you go about cultivating good mentors and advisors throughout your career? Uh, I, I was lucky. I think, uh, you know, I, I think luck will play more, more of a role in your career than anything else. Uh, at Ford, I happened to be hired by a guy who ended up CEO of Ford, Don Peterson. Uh, and, uh, and, and he liked me because he had gone to Stanford, gotten an MBA, he had an engineering degree. I was him 20 years later. And, uh, and he took an interest in me. Uh, the other thing is that will give you um, access to mentors is if you have really bad bosses, the, the best thing that ever happened to me was working for idiots. Because you know, if you work for a, a total idiot and, and you rise up to the level of, of getting the job done, despite the fact that you're working for this guy, the, the rest of the world starts to notice that. And they actually, you become the go-to person. You know, how many, how many organizations have you ever been in when you, they say, well, you know, Sam's responsible for this, but if you want to get anything done, go to Sally, because she'll, she'll cut through everything and, and make it happen. And, and if you become that go-to person, then it's amazing the mentors appear. They, they start noticing you, and they, and they seek you out. Uh, you know, I seek out people all the time that I think I can help their career out or, or uh, help them in one form or fashion. Uh, but I don't just do it randomly. I mean, it's, it's people that rise up for one reason or another. Yeah. Don't be shy is the other thing. There's, there's nothing worse than, you know, taking a, a tour or meeting a group of people and, and you find afterwards that, you know, well, you should have talked to, uh, uh, to Sam over here. Uh, he, he's our rising star and... You know, he was huddled in a corner and didn't want to say anything. You, 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 you can't be shy. Any other? I know you're, you're getting uh, ready to go, head off for class. And I won't be offended at anybody that gets up and leaves because they've got to go to class. Hi, I'm Brian. I'm in the Sloan Fellows Program. I had a question about how you draw the line between when a situation is salvageable, like taking charge of... BHP when it looked like it was sinking versus making the decision to close down the plant in Western Australia? How do you know when, when to do one, when a situation is worth trying to save versus when it's not? That's a great question. And, and uh, I've, I've probably been involved in six turnarounds uh, over my career, not just uh, BHP. And in most cases, well, it, it, there's a couple things. One is you've got to have a core business that's working and, and is, you know, a, a, a real gym, you know, the, the Mercedes under the mud uh, kind of thing. It's, the core business has to be solid and 
have a good position. In the case of BHP, they had positions that you couldn't replicate over a lifetime. They had licenses to uh, mine minerals in uh, uh, parts of the world that other companies couldn't get into. They had a joint venture with ExxonMobil that they were producing oil and gas around the world. They had a, a, a area of mutual interest with BP. That uh, things that you know, you said, wow, you know, companies would die for this, uh, for these positions. One of the reasons they had all that is they were kind of viewed as a quasi-governmental company. So then you, you say, well, it, this basic business is really sound. Now, why isn't it making money? And, and why is it in trouble? And then you usually find out that, that it's accounting reasons. Uh, uh, the first company that I, that I turned around uh, was one called Panhandle Eastern. And it was losing. It, it lost a billion dollars. And I looked at the books. And it was making a lot of cash. But it was losing money. And so you get into that and you realize, oh, well, they're putting all kinds of provisions on the books uh, that are, are overly conservative that are showing up as losses. Uh, BHP did the same thing. They underestimated their reserves, so their DD&A was higher. I know you're not all accounting majors, but, but if, you, uh, if, if you have unit of production kind of costs and you underestimate the base that you're spreading it over, you can get your, your margins down to nothing. Uh, and so, you, you know, you look at you, just two, I guess there's just two things. One, look at the business and see, is it basically a sound business that should be making money? And then why isn't it making money and can I fix that? And in the case of BHP, you know, changing some of their accounting, shutting down loss operations that, that they were still betting on that, that weren't going to make it, getting out of businesses that they were trying to get into, uh, they were trying to be the IBM of, of Asia. Well, you know, that's pretty pretty tall order. Uh, they were trying, uh, they had a huge shipping organization. They were the largest shipping fleet in the world. They shipped iron ore and all kinds of stuff around the world. Uh, but the, they weren't any good at it. And, and their shipping business lost money. So, you know, you looked at that kind of stuff and you said, wow, if we can just get them out of this, this garbage business, the core business is really strong. Yes. Whoever's got the mic. <laughs> My name is Jay. I'm an executive MBA pro, uh, program student. You fired many people. Uh, my question is that if any of those come back to you, say, Paul, I am a changed person. Can you hire me back? Did that happen? And would you take him or her back? Uh, I, I have not had one come back and said, would you take me back? But I've had numerous ones come say the best thing I ever did was to fire them. Uh, you know, usually when somebody when you have to fire somebody, they're doing a lousy job and they know it, and they're scared to death and they're hanging on by their fingernails. And when they're fired, it's actually a big relief for them, and it forces them to go out and find something that they can do. Uh, and I and I would say, you know, I've had a number of people get back to me and say thank you for. Uh, uh, for firing me because it changed my life. I, I, I've had, there are 15 CEOs of Fortune 500 companies that have worked for me at one time or another, and a couple of them I'd fired. So, <laughs> and that was the last question I, I'm told. 